Hi guys, welcome back. We're in chapter eight, which is uh, dress as a test of character. Uh, we left off and <laughs> she refused to sleep in the cabin. She went in the tent and then she had that nightmare about Mary on the ship and she woke up and it was pouring rain. <laughs> the tent like blew off of her and she was sitting in a stream of water and then she went inside and had to sleep on the floor on the dirt floor in a blanket by the fire. So let's see what happens next. I awoke early and crept out of the cabin to fetch one of my dresses. It had stopped raining sometime during the night. Remember she had washed all of her laundry and hung it on the um, laundry line outside, which would just be like a rope. And then you would hang your clothes on the rope so then the air would just naturally dry it because there were no dryers. If I were lucky, my dresses would be merely damp and not soaking wet. The sky was gray and grim and the air smelled muddy. I couldn't help but notice that the roof of Mr. Russell's cabin was sprouting moss, which seemed to me a very bad sign. It must rain a considerable amount for moss to grow on one's roof. I saw the abomination the minute I rounded the corner. I did what any young lady would do. I screamed. Handsome Jim came running out of the cabin, rifle at the ready, no doubt expecting to find me in mortal danger. Shoot it, I ordered, pointing at the perpetrator. The cow regarded me with lazy eyes. She was calmly chewing away, a lace-trimmed hem hanging out of the corner of her mouth. Shoot cow, Handsome Jim asked, confused. I stamped my foot. Yes, shoot the blasted beast. Handsome Jim looked worried. That cow, Mr. Russell's, Burton. I don't care, just shoot the wretched animal. I stamped my foot again. Jehu emerged from the cabin looking sleepy. He was shirtless and his hair was mussed. What's all the carrying on? Look, I shrieked. And good morning to you too, Miss Peck, Jehu said dryly. I pointed angrily at the cow, which was methodically chewing, apparently unperturbed by the sight of a man holding a gun pointed in its general direction. That blasted beast ate all my dresses. Jehu started to laugh. It's not funny. What am I to wear? I cried. The blanket slipped and I gripped it tightly around me. What an unseemly predicament. I'm sure a lady like you will figure it out, Jehu said, and still laughing, walked away. So remember, she slept naked because her dress was like soaking wet. So she took it off and slept with the blanket. So all she has is her nightgown and then all her clothes were eaten by the cow, which I didn't know cows ate clothes, but apparently they do. I stared grimly into the smoldering fire. I had reluctantly put on my nightdress, even though it was still wet from the night before. It was itchy and smelled rancid, like the inside of a cabin, but somehow worse. The only other dress I possessed was my wedding dress, and I was not about to traipse around in that. It would be destroyed in no time. Above all, that must be saved for William. What am I to wear? Why don't you ask Suisse to trade one of hers? Mr. Swan suggested mildly. I remembered Miss Heppelwhite's counsel on dress as a test of character, chapter eight. Your true character is shown in your dress, girls. Mr. Swan, those dresses are immodest. He shrugged good-naturedly. The Chinook ladies seem comfortable enough. But Suisse goes around practically naked. Why, you can see her, her ankles in that dress she wears. Her ankles, you say? Mr. Swan rubbed his chin thoughtfully. As if she knew I was speaking of her, Suisse appeared in the doorway of the cabin carrying a bundle. Clearly, Handsome Jim had related the situation to her and she had come ready to bargain. Guess I'll leave you ladies to it, Mr. Swan winked knowing, knowingly and disappeared outside. Suisse undid the bundle and held out a skirt similar to the one she was wearing and a calico blouse. A little girl peeked out at me from behind Suisse's legs. But what can I trade? I asked plaintively. She, Suisse poked me in the ribs, pushing the whale bones of my corset into my side. I inhaled sharply. My corset? I asked in dismay. She nodded exorbitantly. Trade corset. I had one. I had worn a corset for so long. I didn't know what to do without one. What would Miss Hepplewhite say? Furthermore, what would William say when he returned and saw me? What kind of respectable young lady went about dressed like an Indian? A dry one, whispered a voice that sounded suspiciously like Papa's. The skirt and blouse she held out looked so clean and dry. Something in me relented. Very well, I said reluctantly. Suisse smiled smugly. I unlaced the corset, leaving on my drawers and shift, and slipped into the calico blouse, my petticoats, and the chinook skirt. 
The skirt was a series of woven strands of some material that created a thick fringe and left my legs exposed below the knee. It smelled sweet and it was heaven to be dry. It is cedar, Suey said, indicating my skirt, beaten soft. So cedar are trees and they actually smell really nice. So they would take, you know, the a strip of the tree and pound it and beat it to make it soft like a piece of material. I think I talked to you guys about that in class, how if you take a, a, a piece of paper and just keep crinkling it and crinkling it and crinkling it, it'll become really, really soft. So she's wearing a tree. <laughs> The little girl tugged on my hand. Um, oh wait, I missed my spot. Sorry, I could hardly believe I was wearing a tree, but clearly I was. Despite myself, I smiled. It felt, well, nice to not have the corset on. It was somehow easier to breathe. Perhaps Papa was right about corsets after all. The little girl tugged on my hand shyly. I knelt down. And what is your name? Sudi, Suey said with obvious pride. The little girl grinned, exposing missing front teeth. She had a slanted forehead like her mother's and wide, curious brown eyes. It means mouse, Suisse explained. Is she your daughter? Suisse nodded, smoothing her daughter's hair back. I had not yet put my hair up, and it hung loose in a tangle of curls. Sudi reached out and touched it in wonder, pulling her hands through it as if it, to assure herself it was real. Have you never seen red hair? I asked with a laugh as the little girl's fingers caught and tugged through the mass. A sudden image of Mary combing my hair as I sat at my bedroom table at Walnut Street flashed before my eyes, and for a fleeting moment, the feel of those gentle fingers brought back a rush of memories so fierce, all I could do was blink. Mr. Swan was waiting for me on the porch when we emerged from the cabin. You look much improved, my dear, Mr. Swan said brightly. She looks beautiful, a voice said admiringly. Jehu was leaning against the porch. I shifted awkwardly in my new outfit. How strange it felt to be in public without a corset. I had to force myself not to cross my arms in front of my chest. As if sensing my discomfort, Father Joseph appeared at that very moment and frowned, <coughs> sorry, uh, and frowned at me. That ensemble is hardly appropriate for a decent Christian girl, he said sternly. I felt like perishing on the spot. Mr. Swan came to my rescue. He, clear, he cleared his throat loudly. Come, Miss Peck, we have an errand requiring all haste, he said, waving a sturdy-looking walking stick importantly. I looked at him blankly for a moment, then realizing his game, said, Oh, yes, we must hurry. I was anxious to be away from Father Joseph's admonishments, and if the sky was gray, it was starting to drizzle. Mr. Swan's Mr. Swan's eyes crinkled softly in understanding. I followed Mr. Swan as he trampled down the, st the stream where a strange looking collection of buildings was situated. There were Indians everywhere, women laughing, small children running and playing, men chattering away to each other. This is Toke's village, he said. Those are the lodges. Mr. Swan, I need to secure a messenger to send word to William, I reminded him. Of course, my dear. I followed him over to one of the long wooden lodges. How do we get in? I asked, looking for a door, but seeing none. Through here, Mr. Swan said, disappearing through a small opening near the ground, a sort of rabbit's hole, but big enough to fit a person. I slipped after him into the dark hole, and I fairly gasped at astonishment at the scene before me. The room was massive, and fire pits lining the center bustled with activity. There were women preparing salmon, babies being cared for by their mothers, and men engaged in a fierce game of some kind. Dolly smiled shyly at me from the corner where she appeared to be weaving a basket. Remember, Dolly is Suisse's slave. So, um, Sudi is Suisse's daughter. Dolly is the slave. Huge bunk-like structures, platforms really, were arrayed against the walls, and it was perfectly astonishing to see whole families perched on these platforms observing us with great interest. It appeared that several families lived in Chief Toke's large lodge. What was most astounding was that the lodge was so clean and tidy. The floors were lined with mats, and it all smelled sweetly of cedar. Mr. Russell's cabin seemed positively a pigsty in comparison. Chief Toke was sitting on a platform at the end of the room. When he saw Mr. Swan, he gestured to us. Mr. Swan explained my situation to him, and in short order, we were discussing my needs with a young man. This is Yella. He is one of Chief Toke's nephews, and he is acquainted with William and says he has a fair idea of where William might be, Mr. Swan said. Yella had a ring made of a shell in his nose. I couldn't stop looking at it. Does he speak English, I whispered. I'm afraid that Yella does not. Most of the Indians prefer to speak the jargon when communicating with whites or other tribes. It's much more practical. 
although I must say some of the Indians, like Suisse and Handsome Jim, speak English quite well. The children seem to speak English the best, but you should really learn the jargon, my dear. It is a fascinating language. It was becoming clear to me that Mr. Swan was very far fond of giving lectures. Will they take American money, I asked? Of course, my dear. How much? Mr. Swan spoke to Yellow and then turned back to me. Five silver dollars. Five dollars, I asked aghast. That was half my funds. So five dollars for us now would be like, oh, here's five bucks. Back then, think about that. I mean, that would be a very large amount of money, especially if all she brought was 10. It's half of all that she has. He says five do silver dollars for 15 days travel north and 15 travel back. A month to be clear. If he does not find William in that time, he will come back. You must make him a counter offer, my dear, Mr. Swan said. I needed to make my $10 last. Tell him $3 for 10 days in each direction. Mr. Swan translated and Yellow shook his head. He said that he heard from a cousin that William has gone very far north and that it will take him at least 12 days. His final price is four silver dollars. I looked at Mr. Swan anxiously. He smiled apologetically. My dear, I do believe that William has traveled a considerable distance. Very well, I said, four dollars for 12 days each way. I handed him the money. Do not go a day over 12 days. Mr. Swan related my concern to Yella. The man inclined his head gravely. He promises to travel 12 days only. I looked at Yella suspiciously. Mr. Swan nodded reassuringly. Have no fear. Chief Toke says he is very capable. I was having a hard time considering anyone who had a ring in his nose as capable of much of anything. The fellow couldn't even sneeze. How could he find William? Is he trustworthy? I asked. I confess I don't know him very well, but he seems a nice enough lad to me. It wasn't as if I had much choice. Very well. Mr. Swan grinned at Yella and nodded. Now that that's resolved, why don't we make our way down to the beach? Mr. Swan suggested cheerily, as if it were an ordinary day and we were just setting out to call on a neighbor. I tromped after him along a narrow trail. It was drizzling harder now, but Mr. Swan seemed not the least bit bothered. I could feel my hair start to escape from its knot. My hair was at its worst in wet weather. Does it rain here very much? I asked. Nearly always, my dear girl. I was doomed. Except, of course, in the summer when it is quite beautiful. Just wait until July, he promised. We made our way down to the dark sandy beach where a large canoe rested. It was the same canoe Mr. Swan had met us in the day we arrived. That's mine, isn't she a beauty? I judged the canoe to be nearly 30 feet long. That's really long. It looked as if it could carry a dozen people. There was a carved head of a bird on its prow and it was painted black on the outside and red on the inside. It was indeed quite impressive. Just that visual sounds very striking. If you picture on the outside of the canoe being black and the whole inside of the canoe being red, that would be like really intense colors. Toke traded it to me. It was carved from a single cedar tree. Can you imagine? He shook his head in wonderment. It took more than three months to make and look, those are little snail shells embedded as decoration. Simply marvelous workmanship. He reminded me of the way Papa talked when he was excited about an interesting case. Except, of course, Mr. Swan wasn't a surgeon. In fact, I wasn't at all certain what his occupation was. Mr. Swan, why are you here? I asked. I am chronicling these Indians, Jane, he said. He drew, one, he drew out a small diary from his pocket. I write down my observations on the Indians and their customs and their languages. And then, of course, there is the flora and fauna of the region, which is distinct and worth studying. It seems a bit mad. Yes, but how could you leave civilization for this, I said. We were standing on the edge of the beach. The horizon was slate gray, the air damp. The trees in the distance rose high and thick. It was all so wild. I longed to see something familiar and civilized, like a proper roof or a cobblestone street. Mr. Swan took a deep breath and gestured wildly. How could I not? This is the frontier, Jane. History is being made all around us and we are in the thick of it. Something stirred in me at his words, something that reminded me of Jebediah Parker and the enthusiasm of a young boy. We're living in exciting times, he insisted, waving a hand. The sun caught his hand and something glinted on his finger. It was a slender gold band. I felt a rush of sympathy for the unfortunate man. No doubt he had come out to escape the memory of his poor dead wife. But Mr. Swan, I said, you will not meet another woman out here in the wild. Why would I want to meet another woman? Isn't your wife dead? My wife dead? No, she is very much alive, as are my two children. I shook my head, bewildered. But where are they? His eyes clouded. Boston. Really? Well, when shall they be joining you out here? I asked eagerly. 
It would be so cheering to have the company of another lady in this wilderness. He sighed heavily. They aren't. Matilda does not wish to come, he said, and I was startled by the sorrow in his voice. But why? She is a lady, he said shortly. I am a lady, I said defensively. There was something about the way he said it that sounded like an accusation. The wind brushed against my legs and I looked at my Chinook skirt. Or I used to be. Of course you are, Miss Peck, but an altogether different sort of lady, I suspect, than my wife. I didn't know whether or not I should be offended, although I imagined that his wife had made the correct decision. There were bathtubs in Boston, not to mention respectable dresses. And wasn't it just a bit odd to abandon one's wife and children to study Indians? We passed a group of Chinook women weaving baskets industriously, and all at once I stopped. Mr. Swan, what am I to do until William arrives? What did you do before you came here? I attended Miss Heppelwhite's Young Ladies Academy. How interesting. He rubbed his beard thoughtfully. And what were you studying? Mathematics? Philosophy? History? Botany? Etiquette, embroidery, watercolors, music, and I had just begun conversational French when I left, I said. In fact, it was William's good suggestion that I attend in the first place. I see, Mr. Swan said. I was an excellent student. Mr. Swan looked at me, his spectacles gleaming in the sun. He had the same expression Papa had when I told him about Miss Heppelwhite's. I imagine you were. Well, I asked, what am I to do? I suppose you'll just muddle along like the rest of us, Mr. Swan said with a jolly smile. And then he started walking on again. That evening, Chief Toke invited us to supper at his lodge in honor of our arrival. Mr. Swan rubbed his hands together. You are in for a real treat, my dear. The floor of the lodge was a hive of activity with supper being prepared. The air inside was smoky from all the cooking and for a moment my eye stung, but then they adjusted to the dim interior. There were no windows and it seemed strangely darker than it had during my earlier visit. I looked up and saw stars glittering through spaces between the cedar planks that served as the roof. Below the ceiling, a grid of poles had been rigged, upon which fish were laid. Mr. Swan, why are there fish hanging from the roof? I asked. That is how they prepare the salmon, with the smoke, Mr. Swan said. So smoked salmon, we, you know, I don't eat it, but people eat smoked salmon now, but the Native Americans were doing it first. Without any hesitation, Mr. Swan scrambled up onto one of the benches arrayed along the length of the lodge, and after a moment I did the same, followed by Jehu. It was consider considerably easier to climb in my new skirt. Nevertheless, Father Joseph shook his head when he saw my bare ankles. Mademoiselle, he muttered under his breath. Sudi caught sight of me and quickly climbed up to show off her doll. It seemed to be little more than a clamshell dressed in a scrap of fabric, but I knew she loved it by the way she hugged it so tightly. I suddenly remembered the rag doll Papa had sewn for me when I was a small girl. I had carried that doll with me everywhere until finally her yarn hair had fallen off and both arms went missing. You love that doll to death, Papa had said with a smile, shaking his head at my poor armless doll. I pictured the lovely dining room in our house on Walnut Street and wondered what Papa was having for dinner. Most likely, Mrs. Parker's roast pork and apples, I thought with a pang. She always cooked roast pork and apples on Thursdays. At least I thought it was a Thursday. Our supper consisted of freshly caught salmon and some strange roasted root vegetables. After the gull incident, I resolved it better not to ask. I looked around. Although there were rough looking bowls with carved spoons, there were no forks or knives in sight. Mr. Swan winked. You must use your fingers, my dear. Heavens, people of polite society simply did not use their fingers, but my belly was growling in a most determined way. In my fuss with the dress that morning, breakfast had been forgotten. All the others seemed to be using their fingers. What would Miss Heppelwhite say? My belly growled loudly. Jehu heard it and laughed. Better eat, Miss Peck. Gingerly, I picked up a piece of fish and put it in my mouth as quickly as I could. The salmon melted on my tongue. It was delicious. In short order, my salmon was gone and my fingers were sticky. Deportment at the dinner table, chapter seven, advised that a handkerchief could be used in a pinch if a napkin could not be found, but I had neither. I glanced around and then when I saw it was positive no one was looking, quickly licked my fingers. You should have brought one of those embroidered hankies, Jehu said. I blushed at being caught. A moment later, a bowl of water was passed around the room to clean our fingers. It seemed that the Indians had their own version of proper table manners after all, although Mr. Russell, gentleman that he was, preferred to use his sleeve instead. I'm taking some of my boys and looking for a timber claim tomorrow, Swan, Captain Johnson boomed. Very good, Captain, Mr. Swan said. 
A flicker of appreciation shot through me. I turned to Jehu. Will you be joining the captain? I did not want to be abandoned with only Father Joseph for company. He shook his head. I'm staying here to make repairs on the Lady Luck. I nodded, unaccountably relieved. Brandywine was snoring lightly by one of the fires, his belly full of food. Chief Toke eyed the sleeping dog and said something in the jargon. Everyone laughed. Toke says that dog, he have salmon for Tominoas, Handsome Jim explained to me. What's Tominoas? Chinook people, we all have Tominoas, he said. And what is that exactly? Mr. Swan explained. The Chinook believe that every person has his own guardian spirit, or Tominoas, that watches over him. It's usually an animal, like a bear or an eagle or some such. This guardian spirit protects and guides them. Spirits? Father Joseph asked, his fuzzy eyebrows arching. Yes, my good man, the Chinooks are great believers in spirits, Mr. Swan said. I turned to Handsome Jim. What is your Tominoas? Handsome Jim shook his head. Secret, he regarded me with interest. Boston Jane, you have Tominoas? No, clearly I had no guardian spirit looking after me. If I did, I would never have been in this muddle in the first place. Across the campfire, Chief Toke's sharp eyes bored into mine. He said something and everyone around the fire laughed except Suisse, who looked startled. What, I asked nervously, what did he say? Boston Jane, she have Tominoas because she looks more beautiful in Chinook dress, Handsome Jim said, beaming. Chief Toke spoke again and then grinned at me. Mr. Russell hooted with laughter. Suisse's eyes darted back and forth between the men, her face hardening. Now what did he say? It was terribly frustrating not being able to understand this jargon, and I had a bad feeling they were amusing themselves at my expense. Toke says that you are much better off in the Chinook style of dress than your Boston dress. Now you can run freely like the elk, Mr. Swan said. Ladies do not run, I said firmly. Handsome Jim rapidly translated for Chief Toke. Chief Toke looked as if he felt sorry for me. Toke says Boston Jane, why she not run like to run like elk, Handsome Jim translated. Or kick your heels up and dance, Jehu added softly. Dance, I whispered in a shocked voice. That's a dress meant for dancing, Jehu said. His eyes seemed to glow in the firelight. I held up my hand as if to ward away the very idea. Miss Hepperwhite is firmly opposed to dancing. Dancing is a wicked pursuit, Father Joseph said, as if seconding Miss Hepperwhite's long ago opinion, and not fit for a good Christian girl. Jehu shook his head in disappointment. Chief Toke smiled at me and said something that made Handsome Jim grin wildly. Handsome Jim started to translate. Toke says that Boss and Jane have... Suisse interrupted loudly, her voice strident. Boss and Jane, she not have Tominoas. Boss and Tillicums, they not have Tominoas. Chief Toke looked at Suisse sharply, but Suisse just glared at him. It didn't seem like a good idea to make an enemy of the chief's wife, so I hastened to agree. You're right, of course. I don't have a Tominoas. Boss and Jane, she not have Tominoas, she insisted, looking right at me. Sudi looked on with wide eyes, clearly upset by her mother shouting. Chief Toke barked something at her, but Suisse got up and stalked away. I threw up my hands in be bewilderment. What did I do? I don't know, Jehu said, but you sure do have a way with people. So what did happen there? So Chief Toke is Suisse's husband and he's complimenting her saying, oh, she looks more beautiful in the Chinook dress and her Tominoas is, is an elk or whatever. And Suisse just got super jealous and did not want anyone giving Jane attention. <laughs> Always something going on with Jane, right? All right, so that ends uh, chapter eight for us and I will see you next time.